The following program is from NET. I'm glad you did this. It's good. Let the record show that we are continuing with the jury trial sitting county of Denver versus Lauren Watson. Your Honor. Uh, Mr. Davis. Uh, prior to Mr. Right, uh, Morgan calling his next witness, uh, I would ask uh, permission to recall Officer Cantwell for uh, uh, a few additional questions on cross-examination, if I may. You have no objection, Mr. Uh, yes, I do have an objection, Your Honor. I feel that uh, uh, unless there's some very... Uh, valid reason which we probably should take up at the bench I would object the rules require cross-examination at the time the witness is on the stand except for unusual circumstances if these exist I'll withdraw my objection may I see the attorneys at the bench please I think the ruling on this question really depends on the discretion of the court well, but I would like to hear what the very briefly uh, after the court, uh, I went to the area and uh, discovered some things about the geographical location. I didn't know when he was on the stand related his testimony of the five-minute interval between uh, Juvenile Hall and returning to Juvenile Hall as the security of the this rules. And I just wish to have uh, Officer Kenwood answer a few more questions relating to that. Well, Your Honor, I think that he had the right to... Uh Nobody's closed their case yet, and he has a right to call whoever he wants in Surrey rebuttal, and he can call the officer uh, for cross-examination when I get through with my rebuttal. I have no objections to that. Uh, it's, I guess, more the time than anything else. But Is this agreeable? Yeah, I'll okay. Okay, then I, it's not necessary for me to rule on this question. In that case, Mr. Morgan, would you please call your next witness? Call Mr. George Varney. Trial. The City and County of Denver versus Lauren R. Watson. I'm James Vorenberg. This is the fourth and last day of the trial of Lauren Watson for resisting a police officer. At the time of the trial, Watson was a leader of the Black Panther Party in Denver. I know this from outside the record of the trial. It's not clear what the jury assumes. You will recall that yesterday the prosecutor tried to ask Terry, the South African college student, about Mr. Watson's philosophy. The defense objected, and Judge Weinshank quite vehemently cut off that line of questions expressing her concern that if they were permitted, a mistrial might result. So we just don't know how much the jury knows or assumes about Watson's role as a black militant or how that might affect their judgment. The presentation of evidence is almost over. There are two key issues. First, were Cantwell and the Denver police trying to harass Watson, keep him from making his speaking date that day at Fort Collins? Or were they acting reasonably in making an arrest for a traffic violation, for refusal to show a driver's license, and for eluding a police officer? If they were trying to harass, then their arrest may be no good, and the resistance charge, which is all that is left, 
may fall. The second issue is exactly what happened at Mr. Galloway's gas station. So far, Davies has gotten in some pretty good evidence. The inconsistency between officers Cantwell and Frizzini, and best of all for Davies, Galloway's testimony about Watson's non-resistance. These two issues are different. Either Officer Cantwell did or did not yell white power at Watson, did or did not threaten Watson with harassment. The situation in the filling station, however, is inherently chaotic and confused. Nobody has to be lying for there to have been differing recollections and interpretations of what happened there. Right here, Mr. Barney. Raise your right hand, please. You saw me swear the testimony you're about to give before this court with the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so help you God. I do. Please be seated. Sir. Sir, would you please state <clears throat> your name <clears throat> and your occupation? I am George Varney, Senior Intake Officer of Juvenile Hall. Very, very briefly, in a minute if you can do it, sir, tell us basically of what your duties consist. I uh, work in the intake office. I admit and release children. I confer with uh, law enforcement officers, with probation officers, with out-of-county sheriffs, and with guests who are seeking their way about the juvenile hall. Let me direct your attention to the sixth day of um, November. Uh, 1968. Uh, on that date, do you recall uh, having seen a Denver police officer by the name of Cantwell? Yes, I do. Would you recognize Officer Cantwell if you saw him again? Uh, I would even recognize his voice on the telephone. Uh, is he here in the courtroom? He is. And uh, would you point him out, please? Right there. Uh, can I have exhibit B, please? Mr. Varney, I'll hand you what's been marked for purposes of identification as Plaintiff's Exhibit B, and I'll ask you to examine Exhibit B and tell the court if uh, you r recognize what Exhibit B purports to be. Yes, I do recognize it. What is it, sir? On its uh, fifth admission... Well, I mean, what is the Exhibit B? Uh, oh, uh, it is a copy of the Juvenile Hall records. All right, do you happen to have the, uh, know where the original of uh, these records, of which Exhibit B is the copy, do you know where those, uh, the original is? Yes. Where? In my pocket. All right, do you want to take the original then out of your pocket, and I'll ask you to compare it with the photocopy and ask if... Uh, Exhibit B appears to be an accurate photocopy of the original. It is an exact copy. All right. Now, um, Mr. Varney, uh, referring to Exhibit B, can you tell us uh, whether or not uh, you saw, uh, what time you saw Officer Cantwell at Juvenile Hall on November 6, 1968? Yes, he came in just about 10 o'clock a.m. in the morning. And uh, did he remain while you typed up this slip? We always have him remain around you know, when I'm alone or when it's a little slower, you might say, just for a few minutes. Uh-huh, a few minutes. Mm -hmm. What time did he leave? He left a little after 10, probably. Oh, not... Say five minutes after 10? Oh, I couldn't say just right five minutes after 10. Between, uh... So it was after 10? It was after 10, sometime between 10, 10.30. He left between 10 and 10.30? Somewhere along there. Do you remember what transpired after you made that entry? Can you recall offhand what, what took place after you uh, put 10 o'clock on that slip? Mm, well, it was just after election day, and uh, probably the course of the conversation was just election. Mm -hmm. Did you chat with him for a while? Mm, a little while, not too long. Could you approximate about how long it was? Do you have any idea at all? Oh, well, it was probably within the course of I'd say about 30 minutes. I don't recall right at the uh, exact time. All right. I have no further questions. Your Honor, I uh, move again for the admission of Exhibit uh, B. I have no objection. May so the, B is admitted in evidence. May the Can witness be excused? Yes. Mr. Varney, thank you. You are excused. Thank you. You have no reason to keep Mr. Varney. You may be excused from the courtroom.
Uh, Your Honor, I uh, have no further rebuttal evidence to offer, and this time I have no objections to the uh, defendant uh, recalling Officer Cantwell, as I understand he would like to do. Yes, we would like to call Officer Cantwell just for a few uh, minutes of cross-examination. All right, Officer Cantwell, would you please resume the witness stand and understand that you are still sworn and under oath at this time? Officer Cantwell, relating back to yesterday about your testimony, I would like to have you now draw a diagram of the area uh, involving uh, 29th and California, 29th and Marion, and the route you took from a Juvenile Hall to 29th in California and uh, back. All on one page? Uh, well, yeah, I think if you draw it small, it, you know, small enough scale, you could get it on there. This is California Street here. I left Juvenile Hall here. You park in the back here, come out this alley on the 28th, came down on the 30th. On the California, I got right here. I received a phone call. I made a, a phone call. Well, by this radio, radio, radio call, yes, sir. <coughs> I was making my left hand turn to go back right in this vicinity is where 25th and Liver. And this is the alley here. And this is where I observed this vehicle coming out of the alley right here. He came right on through there, made his left-hand turn. Come on, I could, and how much more do you want? Well, then, uh, half a block here, half a block here, long block here, too short, whichever you prefer. Block here, and then a long block here, right? Yes, sir. Another block here. So we've got uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight blocks, right? Eight blocks to what? That you traveled in that five minutes. Is that right? And according to Mr. Varney's testimony, he didn't leave there till 10.30, is that correct? You heard his testimony, didn't you? Well, Your Honor, I have to check which one of the several questions would the counsel oh. like the witness to answer first. All right, let's have one question at a time. We have no further questions this witness, Your Honor. I have uh, no redirect, Your Honor. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Your Honor, I wonder... Uh, I have no, no further evidence to present. I don't know if Do Mr. Do you have any uh, syrup on Mr. Davis? Yeah, I have just a moment. Your Honor, at this time, uh, I'd like to inform the court that we have no syrup bottle and uh, rest our case. All right. All the evidence is now before the court and jury. Is that correct? That's correct, Your Honor. At this time, then, we are going to have to take a recess in order to uh, get the instructions on the law ready for the jury. Uh, I will assume that this will be a long enough recess that you may take a coffee break if any of you would like to go down to the lunchroom. Again, the same instructions to each of you concerning no discussion, uh, concerning the case, no communication with the attorneys or witnesses or, or defendants. I would ask you to report back to the courtroom at uh, 20 after 11. When you do return at 20 after 11, would you go directly into the jury room and would you shut the door so that you cannot hear the arguments on the wall? All right, you are excused at this time for coffee. At this time, Your Honor, we would uh, like to renew our motion under Rule 129 of the Rules of Criminal Procedure for the County Courts, a motion for a judgment of acquittal. As the court will uh, recall, this motion was made to the court at the end of the uh, state's testimony. And of course, the rule provides that uh, the motion may then be renewed at the close of all the testimony. And uh, in 129B provides if a motion for judgment of acquittal is made at the close of all the evidence, the court may reserve decision on the motion, submit the case to the jury and decide the motion either before the jury returns a verdict or after it returns a verdict of guilty or is discharged without having returned a verdict. Uh, 
and then goes on to provide for a 10-day period uh, for renewal of the motion once again. Your Honor, our motion is substantially the same as it was before, with the added uh, uh, testimony before the court relating to any re alleged resistance in the uh, filling station at uh, 34th and Franklin. The testimony substantially was uh, that uh, Mr. Watson was at the phone, as Mr. Frazzini and Mr. Cantwell suggested. And then, as Mr. Frazzini testified, and Mr. Galloway uh, and uh, the young lady from South Africa uh, testified, Mr. Watson, while at the phone, the officers came in the door, grabbed Mr. Watson, spun him around, and uh, handcuffed him with no discussion uh, contrary to, in line with what Mr. Frazzini said, and contrary to what Mr. Cantwell said regarding a advisement of his rights and uh, a request that he place his hands on the wall. There seemed to be none of that. Now, I would like to re uh, uh, refer the court to the case of Landry versus Daly, 288 Federal Sup at uh, page 194. Uh, you may recall the testimony of Mr. Galloway that <clears throat> uh, the, uh, when, when Mr. Watson turned around, it was somewhat of a, one, a reflex action, and two, uh, being spun about by the police officers. Uh, I think this is uh, parallels the factual situation in the case of Landry versus Daly. And uh, quoting from the court's decision, it says, nor do we find probable cause for prosecuting Reverend uh, Lawrence on the charge of resisting arrest. The only act which supports the charge is Lawrence's pulling his arm away from Reardon. I think that's Lieutenant Reardon of the uh, Chicago Police Department. When Reardon placed him under arrest, the testimony of all witnesses indicates that this movement was almost a reflex a action, not that it was a reflex action, that it was almost a reflex action. Uh, I would su suspect we can infer that there might have been some hostility involved. The apparent unintentional nature of this action, when coupled with the admitted willingness to submit to the custody of the officers immediately thereafter, his admitted willingness, and Mr. Watson had, had admitted that he was willing and did not, uh, uh, was not unwilling, to the custody of the officers immediately thereafter requires the conclusion that no probable cause exists for the charge of resisting arrest, and accordingly they uh, enjoin the state court from pursuing in any prosecution along those lines. Again, there's been no evidence uh, showing specific intent, and in fact, not enough evidence, Your Honor, to show a uh, resistance uh, that could possibly uh, allow this jury to uh, speculate on uh, the facts. I think the facts are clear. I don't think that the court can say as a matter of law that the jury could find the defendant guilty beyond a reasonable doubt of this charge of resistance. No blows were struck. No officer was hit. No officer was pushed. The only thing is that Officer Cantwell lost his balance when Mr. Uh, uh, Watson turned around when he had his back to them. Officer Cantwell lost his balance, and that's the only testimony of any overt act which I think brings it squarely within Landry versus Daly. The only testimony, even by the prosecution's witnesses, Frazzini said that was the only thing that happened. That they then uh, handcuffed him and drug him out. I don't believe the court under the law is quoted to you throughout this case, and I'll be more than happy to re reiterate those uh, citations and that the quotations from those courts in all jurisdictions regarding this, that this court can allow this jury to speculate on uh, this case. Therefore, we would ask the court to uh, grant the motion, or at the very least, exercise its discretion under Rule 129B and reserve the motion for uh, reserve ruling on the motion. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Morgan. I'm happy that I can be brief on this rebuttal uh, argument, Your Honor. The uh, test, of course, which the court must follow at this time is in reviewing the evidence, not as a trier of fact, but as a matter of law, is to determine, again, whether or not there is, if there's a conflict in the evidence, and if there's any competent evidence upon which the reasonable men might differ, then it becomes 
purely a question for the jury to resolve. For the court, in other words, to grant the motion at this time would require that the court, as a matter of law, find that there was no credible or competent evidence to support the material allegations of the resistance ordinance. There has been enough evidence to indicate from the testimony that Watson was under arrest the first time that he was asked for his driver's license and said he didn't have to show it. I think a total of at least three times he was placed under arrest. This certainly would, uh, if the jury believes this evidence, this would certainly uh, lend great credence to and, and would explain without any doubt the actions of the defendant in struggling when he was placed under arrest in the service station when they had to take him into custody uh, by force. Uh, we have evidence that he did offer physical opposition to the officers in the service station. There's contrary evidence that he didn't. Well, this is purely and classically a matter for the jury to determine. I would feel it would be error on the part of the court to grant the motion in the contradictory state of the evidence. This is classically a case for the trier of fact to determine. Any rebuttal argument, Mr. Davies? I have no... no. Well, basically, it appears to me that there's two questions. The one question is whether there's any evidence of physical struggling resistance uh, which the jurors, reasonable men, could believe. And the question on that question I have already ruled on. Uh, both officers have testified that, in fact, there was swinging of arms to swing the officer loose. Uh, uh, attempting to move his body so that uh, it was difficult to get handcuffs on. A general struggle as they were attempting to uh, search him and get him out the door. And this is the uh, same ruling I made before. So there's a prima facie case. Now, the second question, there's a question of fact for the jury. The second question, as I understand Mr. Uh, uh, Davies' argument, which, uh, which I would like to think about a little more, perhaps, really goes to the uh, nature of this struggling. Obviously, this isn't a swinging of the fist at the police officer. This isn't a very... Uh, aggravated resistance, perhaps in the in the spectrum of resistances, um, and if I understand the argument of Mr. Davies, the question is whether this action that was testified to, that is their prima facie, really rises to the dignity of a resistance. Whether this really goes to the charge itself, or whether it maybe goes to penalty, how serious it might be. Um, on this question, what I am going to do is to um, reserve ruling on the motion. I think there is evidence by the police officers. What this evidence means, the interpretation, uh, the court will consider, if necessary, at a later point. The court will reserve ruling on the motion uh, until after the jury's verdict. Time, I would at this time, Your Honor, like to submit to the court and to uh, copies of which will go to Mr. Uh, uh, Could you bring in some stock Morgan. instructions, please? Three special instructions which I uh, would uh, request be submitted to the jury relating to the case and for which I am prepared to argue the law in support thereof. What I would like to do to see if we can expedite this a little bit is to uh, see if there's any instructions that you are not in opposition to, Mr. Morgan. Uh, give both of you a chance to look at the court's stock instructions. Don't we have a stock instruction that places the defendant in with the rest of the credibility of witnesses instruction? Come up, Mr. Morgan. Uh, I recall one I've had another court which is basically this instruction, but says, which includes... It the, just says the words including, including the defendant. Including the defendant. Yes. Your Honor, I'm tendering this instruction, which is a stock instruction, and which has been uh, approved. Uh, it's approved uh, and 
had used as a matter of course without objection in the district courts of every judicial district of this state. Uh, I assume that was a stock instruction. If it's not considered a stock instruction, then I'll tender it. Well, Your Honor, I don't think that stock instructions are anointed with holy water. You know, that doesn't uh, prima facie make them acceptable. It singles him out. Uh, I would say that the way this case has been going, that uh, Mr. Davies probably has a point that this last paragraph, now I'm not particularly worried about the first paragraph, but the last paragraph um, singles out the defendant more than, say, the police officer would be singled out as a witness. Well, I... Uh... Mr. Davies, what part of your evidence do you feel goes to the question of specific intent? And the reason I'm asking this question is to see really whether uh, this instruction goes to the facts. What specific evidence goes to specific intent? Well, I don't, Your Honor, the definite, in fact, we've missed a stock instruction. Would, well, let me ask this. Is resisting a police officer, the prohibition against resisting, or, or is resisting a police officer a crime? It is criminal in nature, a violation of ordinance. It's an ordinance offense. Well, is it a crime? I mean, it's, it's, it, the man can go to jail for 90 days and, and uh, $300 fine. The definition of a crime in Colorado is joint operation of act and intent. Is this malum prohibitum? Well, is that what you're saying, like a parking ticket? What, what do you want to do about the uh, Colorado Supreme Court decision on ordinance violations? Well, what, what does it say? Mr. Morgan mentioned it. Do you have that with you? Uh, mm -hmm. Yes, I think I do, Your Honor. Well, I'd like to, is that 10 Colorado? I'd like to see it. Can I be excused to get that decision? I, I'm sure. I'll tell you what, I think we're going to have to all be excused to look up the law, so let's, let's hold on until I hear his arguments on the last instruction, and then we'll take a short recess right. to get the statutes out. If you were confused by the negotiations between the lawyers and the judge over the instructions, I'm with you. Instructions are the legal framework within which the jury is to find the facts and thereby decide the case. Some of these instructions are standard, such as who has the burden of proof and what is a reasonable doubt. Other instructions relate to the facts of each case, and on these the judge is much more on her own. For example, Mr. Davies lost his attempt to get the judge to take the case away from the jury and dismiss it herself on the theory that Mr. Watson swinging around was just a reflex action. We can be sure that Davies will try to get her to lay that same issue before the jury so that they can decide on that basis. Lawyers and judges see the instructions as crucial. If the judge is too favorable to the defense, the jury may be misled and acquit when they should convict. If she turns down a request by the defense, which an appeal court later says should have been granted, <coughs> she may be reversed. I suppose that's why she wants a chance to look up the law before issuing the instructions. If the instructions are the lawyer's notion of how they can make themselves understood to laymen, I suppose viewers who are not lawyers can make a judgment of their own as they hear this able and conscientious judge instruct the jury, a judgment about how successful that form of communication is. After the jury is instructed, the lawyers will make their closing arguments. I urge you to put yourself in their position now. Davies, the defense lawyer, made a lot of the issue of police harassment at the beginning of the trial. How badly was he hurt by Varney, the rebuttal witness, who made it pretty clear that Cantwell was somewhere else when Watson and Terry said he yelled, white power. If you were in Davies' shoes, would you now still be pushing the harassment issue? More basically, the question is, what do each of the lawyers want the agenda in the jury room to be? Of course, the jury will have to consider what happened in the gas station. Was Watson still talking on the phone when the police broke in? Did Watson deliberately hit out at the police, or was he just, by reflex, swinging around? But will they also discuss Officer Cantwell's motives, in effect put him and his department on trial? Is it in the defendant's or the prosecution's interest that this jury, in this case, do so? The jury really has two roles to play. One is fairly specific, though difficult, deciding about the facts as they heard them. But there was a broader reason we have juries. We have the notion that a jury reflects community norms, community values, and that brings us back to where we started. What community? Whose community? Mr. Watson's community? The second role of the jury is a much harder and more uncertain one. It can represent prejudice, favoritism, resentment, fear, and a lot of other things we don't want in the system. Or, if the system works, it can represent justice.
All the evidence in this case is now before the jury, and at this time I will read to the jury the instructions on the law. Section 847.1-1 of the ordinance, it shall be unlawful for any person to resist any police officer, any member of the police department, or any person duly empowered with police authority while in the discharge or apparent discharge of his duty. The complaint is a mere accusation against the defendant and is not in itself any evidence of the guilt of the defendant, and no juror should permit himself to be influenced to any extent, however slight, against the defendant because or on account of the filing of such complaint. The law presumes the defendant to be innocent, and this presumption continues until overthrown by evidence sufficient to exclude all reasonable doubt of his guilt. This rule of law, which clothes every person accused with the presumption of innocence and imposes upon the prosecution the burden of establishing his guilt beyond a reasonable doubt, is not intended to aid anyone who is in fact guilty to escape, but is a humane provision of the law intended so far as human agencies can to guard against the danger of an innocent person being unjustly punished. The burden of proof is upon the city to prove each and every material allegation in the complaint regarding any charge to your satisfaction beyond a reasonable doubt. And if you find from the evidence that the city has failed to so prove any one or more of the material allegations in the complaint regarding any charge, you will find the defendant not guilty of that charge. Upon the other hand, if you find from the evidence that each and every material allegation of, in the complaint regarding a charge has been proven beyond a reasonable doubt, you will find the defendant guilty of the charge. You are further instructed that while you are not to find the defendant guilty if you entertain a reasonable doubt of his guilt, you are not to search for a doubt. The doubt referred to must be such a doubt as would naturally arise in the mind of a reasonable person upon review of all the evidence in the case. It means a serious, substantial, and well-founded doubt, and not the mere possibility of a doubt. The court instructs the jury that they are the sole judges of the credibility of the witnesses and of the weight to be given to the testimony of each witness. You should take into consideration their means of knowledge, strength of memory, and opportunities for observation, as shown by the evidence in the case, the reasonableness or unreasonableness of their statements, the consistency or inconsistency of their testimony, the motives actuating them so far as such motives appear from the evidence in the case, the fact, if it be a fact, that they have been contradicted by other evidence in the case, their bias, prejudice, or interest, if any has been shown, their manner or demeanor upon the witness stand, and all other facts and circumstances shown by the evidence, which in your judgment affect the credit due to them, respectively. If after considering all the evidence, you find that any witness has willfully or corruptly testified falsely to any fact material to the issues in the case, you have a right to disregard the whole or any part of his or her testimony. When the defendant testified as a witness in this case, he became the same as any other witness, and his credibility is to be subjected to the same tests as are legally applied to other witnesses. In determining the degree of credibility that should be accorded to his testimony, testimony you have a right to take into consideration his demeanor and conduct on the witness stand. In order to find the defendant guilty of the charge of resistance, you must first find beyond a reasonable doubt that the police officers had probable cause to make the arrest. You are further instructed that the term probable cause means, means facts and circumstances within the police officer's knowledge and of which they had reasonably trustworthy information, which are sufficient in themselves to warrant a man of reasonable caution to believe that an offense has been or is being committed. You are instructed that if you find the police officers had probable cause for arresting the defendant, then in order to convict the defendant of resistance, you must also find beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant intended to resist the arrest by the officers through physical force and violence and did in fact deter the police officers in the performance of their official acts and duty. You are further instructed that the mere remonstrating with or criticizing an officer in the performance of his duties cannot amount to resisting a police officer. You are further instructed that intent may be inferred from all the facts and circumstances shown in evidence and need not be proved by direct evidence. You are instructed that if you find that the physical movement on the part of the defendant 
was merely a reflex action in response to his being grabbed by the police officers, then you must find the defendant not guilty. These instructions contain the law that will govern you in this case, and in determining the facts, you should consider only the evidence given upon trial, evidence offered at the trial and rejected by the court, and the evidence stricken from the record by order of the court should not be considered by you. The opening statements and the arguments of counsel and the remarks of the court and of counsel are not evidence. The arguments, statements, and objections made by counsel to the court or to each other and the rulings and orders made by the court and the remarks made by the court during the trial and not directed to you should not be considered by you in arriving at your verdict. No single one of these instructions states all the law applicable in this case, but all of these instructions must be taken, read, and considered together as they are connected with and related to each other as a whole. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, you will have these instructions with you if you need to refresh your memory uh, on any of the instructions on the law. You will also have with you the exhibits and two forms of verdict. I would ask that all six of you sign your names to either one or the other of the verdict forms. In other words, it must be a unanimous verdict. At this time, we will have closing argument. Mr. Morgan. Mr. Davies and ladies and gentlemen of the jury, we have now arrived at the happy point in these proceedings when you've received all of the raw material necessary to, from which to fashion a verdict. You've heard all of the evidence that will be presented during this case. You've been now completely instructed upon the law. And I must emphasize, if for no other reason than as a reminder to myself that these words of final argument are probably not deathless prose to be remembered a thousand years hence, but as the court instructed you, the final arguments of counsel are not evidence. You don't render your verdict based upon the final arguments, but on the law and the evidence. The question is whether or not you are convinced from the evidence that the city has shown that the defendant, Lauren Watson, resisted a police officer while in the discharge or as the first instruction says, the apparent discharge of his duty. The charge itself is simple. There is a little bit more to it than that when it comes to determining the weight and sufficiency of the evidence. And I think probably, as far as this case is concerned, or any case in which witnesses on both sides give contradictory evidence where there are two or more accounts of an event. It is very important, of course, to apply the instructions which the court gave you on the credibility of witnesses. And let's just stop for a moment, and I'll very briefly call your attention to the evidence which I think makes it abundantly clear that Officer Cantwell had probable cause to make the arrest. In fact, I believe, if I recall the evidence in this case, he placed Mr. Watson under arrest at least three times verbally before they, the police officers that came to assist him were able to aid him in taking him into actual custody. Now, we are fortunate in this case that although the jury does not have the opportunity of taking notes or making memoranda as you go along, and it was a long trial. We're in our fourth day. Still, we have an account of the incident that was made shortly after the incident, which was testified to first, if you will recall, orally by Officer Cantwell and subsequently, the written account was 
offered and admitted into evidence. Plaintiff's Exhibit A, page and a half, line by line account of what occurred. Now, the defendant is not on trial for any of the matters referred to that led up to the charge of resistance. He's not on trial for the traffic charges. The only thing he's on trial for is the resistance. However, as the court instructed you, in order to find the defendant guilty of the charge of resistance, you must first find beyond a reasonable doubt that the police officers had probable cause to make the arrest. I would think it would be very difficult to find a case where a person was contacted initially for a very minor traffic violation and when asked to exhibit a driver's license, refused, then being told you're under arrest for failing to have on your person and failure to display a driver's license, the person gets back in the car when the officer went back to get his ticket book, takes off, is stopped again, then told he was under arrest for eluding the police officer, and takes off again, granted not at a high rate of speed, and finally at the scene of the, that culminated in the alleged resistance, when told to put his hands on the car so that he could be searched for weapons, again left the scene, that scene, and went into the service station, where by this time a number of officers arrived, and as you recall the evidence, the evidence which the city offered showed that there was a struggle as they attempted to take Mr. Watson into custody. He struggled before he was handcuffed. He struggled after he was handcuffed. I would think it would be very difficult to review this evidence and find that there was a reasonable doubt that the officer had probable cause to make the arrest. They tried three times before they were ultimately successful. Now the instructions continue and admonish the jury that even if you find probable cause for arresting the defendant, in order to convict him, you must find beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant intended to resist the arrest through physical force. It would seem to me, and it would seem reasonable for the jury, in weighing all of the evidence in the case, to take the circumstances of a person such as the defendant, Mr. Watson, being told on three separate occasions, at three separate locations, you're under arrest, and in each of the first three instances, the defendant leaving, and the officer having to follow, and the entire episode culminating in the necessity of a number of police officers having to push their way into the area of this service station to use force to take him into custody all the while he was struggling, it would seem to me that taking all of the evidence, all the conduct of the defendant leading up to the actual physical opposition which he showed, there would certainly leave no doubt that he had the intent not to be taken into custody. The next instruction, number 10, recites very properly the defendant's theory of the case, taking only the defendant's evidence in the case from one witness. You are instructed that if you find that the physical movement on the part of the defendant was merely a reflex action in response to his being grabbed by the police officers, then you must find the defendant not guilty. As I recall it, one of the witnesses testified that from his view, testified in substance, that from his view, when Mr. Watson turned around and when the officers were trying to take him into custody, the event where Officer Cantwell was dislodged from him, that this was a mere reflex action, 
or at least mostly a mere reflex action. That was the testimony of at least one defense witness. And if you believe that that was the fact, that all there was to this case was Mr. Watson in turning around when he was being taken into custody by a reflex action when he was told that you're under arrest and, and they tried to take him into custody by force, he merely turned around in a reflex action and this was the result of the officer being dislodged from him. If in your view that's, that's all that happened, I would have to agree you find him not guilty if that's all that happened. I think probably in this case it is the simplest summary of the entire case to inquire again as to the reasonableness or unreasonableness of the testimony of a given witness. Watson's testimony was that Officer Cantwell had had numerous contacts with him and that uh, had threatened him and that uh, Watson felt in some fashion that possibly the officer was uh, out to assassinate him, if I recall the evidence. Well, I suppose, in all fairness, if you believe that, if that sounds reasonable to you, taking all the evidence in the case and applying it, I'd have to say, if you really believe this is so, if you believe that Officer Cantwell, in effect, one, harassed the defendant as they testified, if you believe that, you'd have to believe that he fabricated the testimony of the physical opposition to the arrest. You'd have to believe that he fabricated the whole chain of events. On the other hand, if canvassing all the evidence in this case, you believe, as I urge upon you, the evidence I think reasonably and clearly shows that Officer Cantwell didn't know this man. He certainly didn't know who was in that car. He saw a traffic violation. He tried to stop him. He was going to issue him a simple ticket. And the man took off. If you believe from the evidence rather that Officer Cantwell was doing what we would hopefully expect our peace officers to do, enforce the law as the agents of all of us, then I would say you would have no choice but to find the defendant guilty. Closing argument, Mr. Davies. Thank you, Your Honor. Ladies and gentlemen, I'll try and be as brief uh, about this as possible, although it has been a long trial, and I'm sure you'll understand any uh, overextension of my time and your patience. You'll recall that you made many promises on uh, board deer examination. Uh, we talked about reasonable doubt, presumption of innocence and you all agreed with those uh, principles and all agreed that you would like to have them applied to you. Now, of course, is the time that you have to make good on that promise, and I'm sure that you all will. We've heard a lot about uh, what you have to find to uh, convict the defendant. Of course, you have to find that Mr. Watson uh, actually resisted the arrest by Officer Cantwell in the filling station. And you have to find that fact beyond a reasonable doubt. You can have no doubt in your mind whatsoever. Now, then the question is, you have to somehow, out of this rather large spectrum of facts and incidents that went on, you have to come up with a conclusion that, as far as you're concerned, beyond any reasonable doubt, that you have no uh, question in your mind under the definition is given to you, that Mr. Watson resisted the arrest by Mr. Cantwell. Now, first of all, I think it's important for you to remember one thing. 
Mr. Watson testified on his own behalf. He was asked, did you intend to resist this arrest? His answer was no. Now then, taking Officer Cantwell's testimony, you recall that he testified in the morning that when he stopped Mr. Watson the first time, he did not place him under arrest. We got the report. In the report, he says he did place him under arrest. Now, one of those two times, he wasn't accurate. Was it just a memory lapse? The report he made that's going to be in evidence was not under oath. The statement he made on the stand, in direct examination, that he did not arrest the defendant was made under oath. This is not a sworn statement, and I want you to keep that in mind. Now then, Officer Frazzini testified. You all recall that. He testified that he got a call, and he came to 28th and Marion. Now, they were stopped at 29th and Marion. The first stop was made at 29th and Marion, as you recall. That he picked up Mr. Watson and Mr. Cantwell driving along the street at 28th. Maybe it was 29th. Doesn't matter, but he saw them. That he got behind Mr. Cantwell. That another officer, as I recall, Mr. Pinto, got behind him. And they followed Mr. Watson to 34th and Franklin. And neither Mr. Watson, nor Mr. Cantwell, nor Mr. Frazzini, nor Mr. DePinto stopped in that entire period of time. And yet Cantwell says they stopped twice, and the defendant said they stopped twice. Now, where was Frazzini? Was he there or wasn't he? Why is there such a fantastic discrepancy? All right, getting back to Cantwell. He indicated that he pulled into this station, that Mr. Watson pulled into the station. He said, you're under arrest for looting a police officer and put your hands on the car. We're going to search you. Officer Brzezini says, no, uh, I was right there simultaneously, and that didn't happen. Well, this is, these are their witnesses. Our witnesses happen to agree with Officer Frazzini that that wasn't said. But they can't even remember what happened. Watson went into the station. Cantwell says they broke their way in. At first, he said it was him and Frazzini. In the report, he says it was uh, he and DePinto. Another discrepancy that he can't remember. He says he went in, and he went up to Watson. And he says, put your hands on the wall. I'm going to search you. And he says, Watson refused to be searched. And they had to subdue him. Officer Verzini was right there. He doesn't remember that. He says, he says, as do the defense witnesses say, they just ran in and grabbed Mr. Watson, one on each arm. Watson turned around, and Cantwell lost his balance. And DePinto was there, too. No mention of this request that he put his hands on the wall and that he submit to a search, none whatsoever, even though Cantwell, under oath, says that's what happened. Now, here's a picture of a melee of three officers at first. Apparently, according to their testimony, other people in this small station, two people, one that owns the station, another person there, a general melee going on. He is putting up a fantastic struggle, according to Cantwell. He's, Cantwell's being thrown off his feet. And at all this time, he's saying, Mr. Watson, you have a right to a lawyer. Anything you say may be held against you. If you can't afford a lawyer, we'll get one for you. It stretches the imagination, especially in light of the fact that Cantwell has been contradicted throughout this thing by Frazzini. And yet, there were no discrepancies shown in Mr. Watson's story through cross-examination. He has the right to cross-examination. He didn't show any discrepancy, not the kind of discrepancies that were in Mr. Cantwell's testimony. There was no other witness for the defense who took that stand and contradicted Mr. Watson, whereas they put a witness on that contradicted Mr. Cantwell in many very serious specifics of the story. A young lady, you saw her. Examine her demeanor. Young lady from South Africa, what's her interest? She heard Cantwell come up the car the second time and said, no, I just want to harass you. 
All right, she's lying too. They're all lying, even though there are no discrepancies in their story. They're all telling the truth, even though they can't agree on what the truth is together. It does not make sense, ladies and gentlemen. And it's on that that this man is saying to you, you affect a substantial portion of this young man's life. I don't think you can do it. The system won't allow you to do that. The finest system of justice in the world will not allow you to do that. Mr. Galloway, he owns a filling station. He's a hardworking man. He's trying to make a living at 34th and Franklin. He's sitting there. He says, Watson comes in to use the phone. That's, that, everybody agrees on that. When the police came in the door, Mr. Watson was on the phone. They came in, they grabbed him, he turned around. He didn't struggle. He didn't, nobody's ever said he swung. There's one issue of resistance in this case. That when he turned around, Cantwell lost his balance. And according to Cantwell, there were a lot of people around. Two other officers on one person. He lost his balance. Therefore, he resisted arrest. Galloway says no. He saw the whole thing, and Watson didn't resist arrest. Mr. Watson took the stand under oath, and that, did you intend to resist this arrest? No, I didn't. He says, I was, in fact, they were, had my arm up, they had another arm here. Certainly, you would too. If Mr. Watson had on this particular occasion, as soon as they came in that door, what would be the extreme of non-resistance? You lay down, you go limp. That, he'd be in here for resisting arrest. What can he do? That's not resisting arrest. Nobody got hit. No police officer got hit or pushed. Cantwell lost his balance. That's it. That's this case. I hope that you will read these instructions uh, very carefully. I would like to very briefly direct our attention to three of them. First of all, you must realize that you have some steps to go through in this case before you can convict. In the first instance, you must say, the police officers had reasonable grounds or probable cause to go in that filling station and arrest Watson. Now then, is a man who is, you know, resisting arrest and, and wants to get away from the police officer under the police officer's set of facts, going to keep stopping his car and go back to the officer and say, uh, what is it? If Cantwell told him he was arrested the first time, it was a little redundant on the part of Watson to stop the second time and go back and say no. I submit it didn't happen. I submit it happened the way Mr. Watson and the young lady said it happened. Now then, you have to say, all right, the police officer, first of all, you have to say, was that, did he have reasonable cause to arrest Watson? Because if he didn't, then there can be no resistance to the arrest. I think you understand that. You cannot resist an unlawful arrest. Once you can say, if you can't answer that question in the affirmative, that is, that there was probable cause, then you needn't go any further. That's the end of the case. You must return a not guilty verdict. But let's say that you do say, well, I maybe had reason to go in there and arrest Watson. Then you have to say, did what Watson do amount to resistance? And you cannot. You, say, you know from the instructions, number one, that his, whatever he said to the officer, and there's been some uh, confusion about that, some discrepancies about that, in addition to the fact that there seems to have been, there's some testimony that the officers were keeping a little verbal abuse of their own. Mere words can't amount to a resistance. The guy comes up and says, you're under arrest. And you say, I'm not going. You can't take me. Forget it. Get out of here, as they cuff you. That's not resistance. And when you're walking down the street and you see officers, police officers, carrying color television sets out of a warehouse, if you say to them, hey, where are you going with that? You can't do that. Very improper comment. There's nothing in the evidence, and it's merely inflammatory, prejudicial, and very improper, and counsel knows it. 
I think I have a very wide latitude. Close Not to that picture. wide, Your Honor. Well... I think this jury is wise enough to uh, use Mr. Um, um, Davies' uh, examples for the purpose in which he shows to give examples and will not be prejudiced. He may proceed with his closing argument. Thank you, Your Honor. The point is, ladies and gentlemen, that people have a duty to remonstrate with police officers if they, in fact, think they're doing something wrong. And the point is that if there were a little more of that in some instances, some very bad things might be avoided. It's merely an example to show you why the law, in its wisdom, says the mere remonstrance and criticism and so forth cannot be resistance, even though you're being arrested. You must find that the resistance was through physical force and violence and did, in fact, deter the police officers in the performance of their official acting duties. Number one, they weren't deterred. And number two, there's no evidence of physical force and violence. The only evidence is one of turning around, which one witness, a disinterested witness, described as a reflex action. And you're instructed there that if you find that to be a reflex action, you... ...and criticism and so forth cannot be resistance, even though you're being arrested. You must find that the resistance was through physical force and violence and did, in fact, deter the police officers in the performance of their official acting duties. Number one, they weren't deterred. And number two, there's no evidence of physical force and violence. The only evidence is one of turning around, which one witness, a disinterested witness, described as a reflex action. And you're instructed there that if you find that to be a reflex action and you find that was the alleged facts, then you must acquit the defendant. So you see, your work's cut out for you. I think it's cut out for you because there are a lot of peripheral issues in this case. The question of whether Cantwell did in fact come around the house. You don't have to decide that beyond a reasonable doubt. But the issue is, did they have grounds to arrest him? And if in fact when they did arrest him, and they did arrest him, they didn't run out of the gas station after chase him down the street. They arrest him without much difficulty and use some force on him. In responding to that initial grabbing when he turned around and Cantwell went off balance, can you say that beyond all reasonable doubt, this young man should be punished for the crime of resisting arrest after you've read these instructions? I don't think you can. I certainly hope that you won't. I think that you must find the defendant not guilty. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Davies. The city, which has the burden of proof, has opportunity for a rebuttal argument. I have no doubt that the jury takes comfort in the lessons of history that even the strongest gales and hurricanes blow themselves out eventually. And this is even true of the sound and the fury of this trial is just about to terminate. There's very little that I have to say in rebuttal. I think it's probably unnecessary to take as much time as Mr. Davies did in commenting on each and every discrepancy among the witnesses on the defense side but just as an example, you remember that the young lady from South Africa said that when they got to 34th and Franklin, that all four of the males got out of the car and went into the service station right then. And their witness, the service station attendant, said, no, Mr. Watson came in alone. So if we want corroboration from the other side, we can say that Terry, the young woman from South Africa, corroborated Officer Cantwell's testimony that when he the officers tried to get in, there were a number of people blocking the door. I, I must comment with a mixed feeling of admiration and something less than that of Mr. Davies' tactic of trying the police officer, although there was no evidence that 
There is, uh, it's common knowledge that people steal color TV sets. I don't think there was any evidence that this is a custom of police officers, but it is a familiar tactic. Don't try the defendant, try the police officer, throw a red herring, throw dust in their eyes. I think what it boils down to, ladies and gentlemen, is simply this. If, in fact, you believe, and I mean this very sincerely, and I know you do, if you believe from the evidence that this police officer fabricated, if he corruptly testified falsely, you should find the defendant not guilty, and the officer should be certainly very severely punished if he lied under oath. Basically, our whole system, and this is what, why we have laws on resistance, our whole system of law and order depends upon people settling their differences in court and not out on the street. And if we're going to have officers as conservators of the peace, people are going to have to comply with the law of not offering physical opposition when they're accused of something on the street, but litigate the matter in court. We have two choices. If you believe that the officer was performing his duty, we either have to, at some point or another, decide to uphold law and order and have order in our society or follow the law of the jungle and have chaos. Thank you very much, Your Honor. May I have the instructions, please? May I also have exhibits A and B? Exhibits A and B, please. ready to be sworn. Do you solemnly swear by the ever-living God that you will, to the utmost of your ability, keep this jury together in some private or convenient place, without meat or drink, except water, unless by order of court, that you will suffer no one to speak to them nor speak to them yourself, unless by order of court, except to ask whether they have agreed upon a verdict, and when they have agreed, you will return them to court. take the jury out. I'm not going to recess the court. If the jury please would go with the bailiff, Mrs. Dondelinger. I'm not going to recess the court unless you need time, Mr. Morgan. We do have a lot of two o'clock cases. Mr. Davies, you may be excused. Would you let the clerk know where you're going to be so we can reach you, please? Which is the closest one. Pardon? <laughs> okay. I was told that, boy, Davies did a hell of a job, you know. Well, how much does Davies get paid a year, and then how much does our Mr. Morgan get paid a year, you know? How many cases is, is Mr. Davies working on at this moment, and how many cases is Mr. Morgan working on? There's no comparison. But I can't blame, I don't blame Mr. Morgan, because he did a hell of a job for the time he had and, and the facts he had brought up to him. I had to keep telling him, you know, what new facts, because we didn't have time to get together, uh, you know. I think it is unfair. Uh, no court uh, in this country would pertain to me unless it was a court made up, selected, or hired by or whatever uh, by my peers, people, black people who live in the black community who are aware of the situations uh, that I face and I deal with, that all black people in the country face and deal with. Um, a judge from this community, responsible to the people in this community. I mean, I, I came on the job wanting to be a policeman and uh, wanting to do the best I can, and uh, and uh, personally, I think I have done the best I can. Uh, 
uh, it's more than just a job. I mean, it's not like coming home at five o'clock at night, eat supper, watch TV, take the you know family to the movies, and then come home at night, go to bed, get up, eat breakfast, and go to work. And uh, knowing what, what all that's in front of you is uh, the same thing was in front of you yesterday. A policeman's life's not that way. Uh, your shifts rotate every month. Uh, you don't never know what time you're going to get home. Uh, you may get home. Uh, uh, an hour late, two hours late, uh, your wife starts worrying, you know, well, where's he at? You know, maybe he's got shot. Uh, so you don't know. A uh, policeman, uh, uh, you have to be a certain type of an individual to be a policeman. I know there's one fella came on and he got a rock thrown at him, hit him in the foot. And he said, that's it, man. He said, I don't have to take this stuff. And he quit. See, <laughs> what if uh, a thousand policemen did that? We all got through with rocks. What if we all said, well, we don't have to take this. We quit, see. You can't. I mean, uh, I've got a family that I want to protect, too. Well, that was a fascinating trial because in a way that was just a real uh, uh, sort of a, a microcosm of, of what the problem is today in the world. We have the police that are very unhappy with the black militants. We have the black militants that are extremely unhappy with the police. And this is just a beautiful little example of this conflict. And it's not just in Denver. I'm sure it's in every large city and some middle-sized cities. Uh, the black militants may be out to provoke the police, and the police are very unhappy about these militants and will seek any possible excuse for giving them citations, charging them with violations of law. And they, there may be situations, in fact, where uh, one of the militants may be charged with a violation where you or I might not be charged with a violation. This happens. Until someone thinks of a better way to handle the problems, I think it's, uh, it's, the, it's maybe not the best of all possible solutions to solving problems, which is what happens in that courtroom. We're solving problems. Uh, but until someone comes up with a better idea, I think it's pretty good. It's much better than um, having the officer arrest someone and saying, that's it. I have great hope in the system, for the system. No, I believe in it. I really do. I don't think I, I just don't think I could be a judge if I didn't. It works. It has problems. It could be better, but it works. And I don't know of any better system. You know what I just found out? No, uh, I'll tell you in a minute. As as he just flipped coins. He's going to tell you how you won. Heads was not guilty. Tails was guilty, and there's two heads out of three. Okay. Well, that's what Gentlemen. they did, so I suppose we just hope that it's the same way. Well, not was, for two hours. I was they just have. hoping that they would uh, uphold law and order. Give your final instruction after a very good instruction. Ooh, that's you delicious. think that's what it is, right? A flip of the coin? Yeah. No, I've never tried this. I was joking before. I've never seriously tried to predict a jury's verdict because anytime you try, you're wrong. Judge Burnett, please come in. Leonard, what do you think? About what? Can you predict the jury? <laughs> well, I think it's always possible to predict the jury. I, uh, I think that the uh, fair decision, the just decision, would be an equivalent. I've been alarmed somewhat by this jury panel as you know, uh, from my remarks in court. Uh, it's sort of, my, my prediction is that they'll acquit, and it's somewhat of a self-denying prof prophecy because I think there's, uh, I predicted that it, the panel would convict uh, because of the way it was made up, and my whole argument about the construction of the jury panel would be supported by that. But uh, at this point, it's difficult to tell. We pray for an acquittal, and uh, we'll take what we get, I suppose. And, Oh. Well, my feeling was that we had a reasonable, although not a serious case, it was a technical violation. The jury could go either way. Uh, I think if they return a verdict of guilty, that it's a very proper verdict. And uh, I have enough faith in the jury system that if they return a not guilty verdict, I think that's a proper verdict also. Thank you.
Let the record show we are continuing with the case of City and County of Denver versus Lauren Watson. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, have you reached a verdict in the case? We have, Your Honor. All right. Would you please hand your jury verdicts to Mrs. Don Belinger, the bailiff, who will hand them to me so that I can read them into the record. In the case of the people of the state of Colorado and City and County of Denver, versus Lauren R. Watson, defendant. The verdict reads as follows. We, the jury, find the defendant not guilty as charged in the complaint filed herein. Section 847.1-1, resistance. The verdict form is signed by six jurors. Is there any um, four dear that either side requires? No, Your Honor, I don't desire the jury to be polled. Oh, the jury will not be polled. You have now completed your duties as jurors in this case and are discharged with the thanks of the court. Now, let me add just a few more words. As you've, as you've been well aware, we've had a documentary being filmed in here during these four days. Uh, it is absolutely impossible to film a jury deliberating on a case. This has never been done, and it never will be done. Uh, the gentlemen who are putting together this documentary have expressed some interest in uh, filming some conversations with the with you and with the attorneys for the purpose of trying to show the viewing audience, people, how a jury thinks, how they reach a decision. Uh, they would like to, if you desire to, take pictures of some discussion at this time with the attorneys on how you reached your decision. Uh, the court would have no objection, neither attorney has any objection, and what I would say to you is this, if any one of you would prefer not to have this filmed as far as you're concerned, you do not have to do it. In other words, you may just leave now, this is up to you. If any of you would have no objection to discussing the case with the attorneys, as you may do, but to have this filmed while you're doing it, then I would ask that you remain. And uh, as I pointed out, the photographers would like to uh, take pictures of this. This is entirely in your own discretion. You do not have to be filmed. You not, do not have to discuss this before the cameras if you don't wish to do so. I leave this up to you. I thank you personally for your attention these long four days. I wish to thank both attorneys, and I mean this very sincerely, for a very well presented case. I very much appreciate the courtesy and the uh, thinking that went into arguing this case on behalf of both the city attorney and the defense attorney. The court at this time will be in recess until tomorrow morning at 8.30. Primarily because was perchance that the basis? Uh, I'm, it, I'm in interested. It just wasn't quite proven conclusively on a reasonable doubt that there was that resistance. Was well, yes. that was my feeling of, yeah. of what the verdict probably, my we, personal we were, what it should have been based on was the yeah. fact that there wasn't enough physical opposition. Well, if that's what it was. Yeah, uh, that every was it time entirely. I've it ever talked thing, to a yeah. jury, it's restored the faith I've always had in the jury system because. There's just something about six people who get together that seem to arrive at the truth better than any other way I know of. Yeah. And I'm very happy to know that that was your reasoning. You that was the only were... reason I, the only I could mm -hmm. find not guilty was the fact that it wasn't quite proven to beyond the reasonable doubt. That he was really resisting, in other right. words. That's right. right. But you did believe Officer mm -hmm. Cantwell's...
testimony yes. as being the truth. I believe partial uh, part believe, of both sides. Right. We didn't disbelieve everybody, and we didn't believe well, everybody. Fine. Yeah. I appreciate you giving me this information. You just that resistance fact in it. Let me say this. If I thought myself that some police officer were uh, deliberately harassing somebody or deliberately uh, lying about material allegations, we shouldn't have a man like that on the police force. Mm -hmm. we, we, and uh, we I really believed he was uh, conscientious and... Uh, Honest, honest officer. Right. right. I, I think uh, that he was like, trying, but it just didn't. It just, just didn't, didn't appear. Quite, you said to uh, judge by like facts only, and the facts didn't That's point right. to a, <coughs> without a doubt. Well, I, I agree with you wholeheartedly. My personal opinion was that it was a weak case in the facts, but it was strong enough to present to the jury. Mm -hmm. Thank you so very much, ladies and gentlemen. I wish to thank you. I, I think you did your job. Okay, my okay. Yeah. I hope that uh, you benefited from the experience somewhat. I sure did. I think, yeah. it's, quite an I think it's an important function that you want yeah. to play. Yeah. Good job. I benefited immensely. Thank you very much. We said we'd try. Well, and you did, and we're uh, we're very grateful. And it gives some people faith in the yeah. system that perhaps they feel a little bit disenfranchised from it so far. But I did do a very good job, and I appreciate it. As I understand it, I caught just the uh, tail end of Mr. Morgan's comments. Uh, I understand that you just didn't feel there was that reasonable doubt. You yeah. just didn't prove it past the reasonable doubt. Yeah. Yes. There was a doubt. No striking, no hitting, no scars. Uh, apparently, you know what I mean. And it was such a crowded place. Crowded place. That you can't really say what happened. Right. It's difficult for anybody in a, in a situation like that. As far as I'm, I'm personally concerned, it's about uh, Officer Frizzini said he they rushed him. Mm -hmm. They grabbed him and spun mm -hmm. him around. Right. I mean, if, if that hadn't been in the testimony, I believe I could have found the man guilty. And everybody was sure that he was on the phone, so he'd have to turn around. Right. And as they spun him around, I think that's where the resistance charge could have stemmed from. That's why I said there was no reasonable doubt. How many ballots did you take? I don't wish to know who voted how, but I just wondered, what was the first ballot? Do you recall? It was five to one. Five to one. And then there was only one other ballot, or did you? Oh, of course. Well, there was only one. Ballot. There was, there was only one ballot, ballot right away. Mm -hmm. uh, just and it was five to one. Five to one for acquittal, I presume. I presume. Yes. <laughs> question arises with me is that everybody's under oath, and so many stories are told, and you just wonder how. Somebody, yeah. Have you learned anything? Oh, boy. <laughs> Learn something every day. We wrote enough to write a book. <laughs> it's been quite an experience. You know, I, I, what I'm wondering is whether or not you you, you debated all about the fact that you did was said you got a fine, honest, conscientious police officer. There just wasn't enough physical opposition. Okay. Which so you know, they disbelieved the uh, well. No, they uh, believed the facts. Defense. They didn't think that it constituted no, they, resistance. They, they disbelieved the defense on the chase. Well, they said they believed some of what the defense said too. But uh, they didn't believe he was out harassing them and so on. But the thing is, and this is why, every time I talk to a jury, I, I'm just convinced it's the best method of getting well, the, the truth that there the is, you know. Is the, really. the, the moral of the story is that these uh, complaints should be solid. Well, I feel this way. You know I do. But this was enough borderline, as I told the jurors, that I didn't feel it was my function to be the judge in this case. Now, sometimes I do. Like I threw out a case against Watson the week before that was just patently no good. But this one, I felt there was enough to go to the jury, and they, it must have been fairly good if they wouldn't have deliberated over an hour. Yeah, almost two hours. That's true. It certainly makes new stories come alive. Right. Thank you very much. You really did a good job. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. I think you did, too. <laughs> I love to win. I love to win. Louder. <laughs> now there's the victor, not me. That's the that's the victor over there. That's the winner. He has to sit as you know. Be quiet the whole time. I'm not about a year's free service on this thing. <laughs> to whom? Me or you? You. <laughs> Bell I will turn green with envy when he sees you. I don't think so. Perry Mason will even have. Yeah. I don't think so. We're lucky. We're injustice on our side. Really, Lenny. You and I congratulate the jury. Okay. Well, I have a That's the end of the meatloaf. I have a question. So it doesn't this shoot the hell out of the uh, uh, poor, poor jury selection system? No, it doesn't. Why? I think he can answer that better than I. The fact is, you know, uh, 
the fact that we won changes, you know, changes absolutely nothing, you know. If all of the, if all of us had an attorney like Leonard, the fact that we won as black people would still solely be on the basis that we had confident uh, counsel. We are not going to have, in this kind of a capitalistic system, you know, where the majority of attorneys are equally or as much capitalistic as anybody else in the society, uh, <clears throat> charge big fees and everything like that, uh, where even a, a small portion of poor people, oppressed people, <coughs> black people are going to have competent counsel. And all the jury system are in court system amounts to is a contest. The fact is, Clyde, like Morgan, should never beat you on any case. You well, don't you think, really, Lauren, that there might be just one small element in this that the system of justice we have may be a good one? No. What would you replace it with? See, that exactly the point. The very fact, you know, that I'm a, a black man, you know, I have to uh, yeah, I could care less whether six white people who live on the other side of town think I'm guilty or not. That's the whole, that's the thing right there. What the hell do I care what they think? I could give a damn, you know. And as much as they, you know, could give a damn what I think. And yet they're sitting up here, you know, making decisions about my life. That's not justice. He's a good, just attorney because he believes in the system of justice. You see? Now, on the other hand, you know, I don't believe in it at all. Well, but Lauren, so how many trials have we had now? Five, six? Yeah. At least, right? Mm. You've been acquitted on each one with the exception of one minor charge, right? Mm. Don't you think that after a while, aren't you going to start to decide maybe the system does work? We've, we've, we've been successful? The system does not work because I'm, I'm, I'm still the victim. What has happened to the officers who brutalized me, surrounded my home, you know? Uh, dragged me off to jail. They haven't been penalized for this trial. They get paid while they're sitting there, you know, figuring out, trying to get their lie together. You know, it's a just system for white people. I've never, you know, like, for some white people, for middle class and upper, it's a just system. For poor people, for black people, it's an unjust system. And competent attorneys for even the lowest, poorest black man in the community or the lowest, poorest white man in the community, it would not be a system of justice. You know, because the people who created the injustice in the first place were not on trial here today. The officers should have been here, here on trial. They should have been the ones trying to keep the jury from sending them up the river for 20 or 30 years. Not me. You know, you know like, you know, even after li listening to Leonard's closing argument, you know, I, you know, I was more and more angry at myself, you know, for not beating the shit out of them in the first place. You know, I should have res uh, uh, resisted arrest, you know. I should have killed both of them, you know, when they came in the door. And that would have been justice to me. Okay. Uh, Car 214. Maybe you'll take it up there. 214. 1931 Newport. Code 15 additional. I'm not a theft. He's neat. Okay. He'll be back. 206. Hit and run. Car ran into a garage. 3350 Gaylord, okay. Attention all cars. Reading the description of a wanted party. Quiet male. Age 40 to 45. We back here at this height. 142. 240 pounds. Heavy build. Medium complexion. Got brown hair with gray. Where is he? Is balding. 